All right, so this is lecture number 24 in this series about creating an international sustainable civilization. And the previous one, well, two lectures ago was about capitalism and how the globalization process has been mismanaged. And so the West and specifically America has benefit, benefited at the expense of developing countries, even at the expense of our own working class people. So then the next one was about the decline of democracies due to the shrinking middle class or the, um, the loss, the disillusionment of the bottom half um, and the rise of political operatives who want to polarize the public and then uh, criticize their enemies to the point where people will elect them and then they'll just centralize power for their friends and family. So, and then this one is more specifically about um, Indonesia and a recent election and the it's the same book and it's the same quotes from Eve Warburton, who was the Brookings Institute representative for Indonesia, observer of Indonesia. And so it's her observations about the most recent uh, political election. Um, I Again, I don't have any opinion on this. I don't know enough but I know it's themes. And I know if my colleagues who read this get offended, it's it's not my fault. Like I'm just the messenger. So I'm just trying to communicate what somebody at the Brookings Institute is saying about Indonesia and about the prominent politicians. And then Indonesians can decide if Actually, they know more than most Indonesians about what's going on, or if they really don't. And, um, or if maybe, gee, I didn't know that. <laughs> or if, how is it that we're being misperceived? How is it that this candidate that I like is being perceived negatively? Um, is what can we do? What can, if I'm a supporter of this person, what could I do to, so the West would actually be more positive toward, I don't, I don't know. And, um, but it does give you some ideas, some insights into how you're perceived, which is always pretty discouraging. Um, but it's kind of, uh, I, I think if you want to really know how to move forward, you have to dig up all the dirt and find out what kind of gossip is being uh, spoken against you. Like Socrates, people were always gossiping against him and it was false, but he had to put up with it and he had to sort of act in the face of it. And he did everything he could to dispel his rumors. But Socrates said, I don't, you know, I know that I'm trying to defend against 20 years of rumors. It's pretty hard to do that in an hour or something. But anyway, so here's, here's something for Indonesian colleagues to consider. The book was written in 2019. So you can contextualize that with the presidential candidates at that time. And they've had another election since then pretty recently. And then they can you can compare and that I really don't know much about. I read things, you know, I've read about each of the leaders, I've read a, a number of things, but I just have this sense that how am I supposed to know? You know, I can't read the Jakarta Post and think I know everything. So I tend to just try to listen. Um, and see if there's any patterns. And then also ask questions to my colleagues. Um, have you considered this or that? Or compare to my own country and what people know and don't know, or social media, or general media, or Russian bots, or all this stuff. Uh, 
how many Chinese bots are going to come and interfere on social media with Indonesians to get them to do whatever it is they want them to do. But anyway, so the essays by the Brookings Institute, this is a repeat of the first quote I, I said on the first page of the last lecture. At the end of the 20th century, many political observers assumed the coming decades would be a time of democratic triumph. Instead, democratic stagnation and setbacks have marked the first two decades of this century to such an extent that today, talk of a global democratic crisis is widespread. Well, it's even worse as of 2024. We're on the verge of perhaps re-electing Donald Trump after people know, you know, what happened last time. And they should know that he's even more bent on doing even more of the harm he did before. And people are still voting for him. Polarization simplifies the normal complexity of politics and social relations by aligning otherwise unrelated divisions, emasculating cross-cutting cleavages, and dividing society and politics into two separate opposing and unyielding blocks. The distance between groups moves beyond principles, issue-based differences to a social identity. So it's structured, the political rhetoric is structured as a binary, us versus them. In the US, because we're so capitalists, it's a brand. Like you're, I'm a, Republicanism is my brand. Just like I buy Gap clothes, I vote Republican. It's just part of who I am or Democrat. That's, there's no arguments. It's just like I'm a Dallas Cowboys football fan. It has no meaning or purpose. Whereas in politics, these people have the power to destroy life on earth or to move toward preserving it. They have the power to destroy their democracies. They have so much power. It's not at all like analogous to sports events or what kind of clothes you buy. <sighs> so it's, it's very discouraging uh, when people go to these mass rallies that are political rallies it's the same kind of atmosphere as going to a sports event. And people have even reduced going to church to something like a mass rally. It's just, it's all emotion driven. It's a herd instinct. You know, you're with members of your tribe. Okay, not good. But underneath that one-on-one, -on -one, when you talk to people, it's very different. So. My students, I think three quarters of them, really do not have the same worldview that I have. But I'm, it's not polarizing, especially right now. I just tell them the real problem is the centralization of wealth. And that's not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. That's a, that's a money issue. And everyone in this room the students, my students are not the rich people that benefit from tax cuts for billionaires. They belong to the bottom 80%, um, maybe even 60%. And I just say, we're all in this together. And so we should vote on the basis of which uh, decisions, which candidates are most likely to promote human flourishing in a middle class. And that shouldn't be a polarizing issue. So I don't really feel polarized against my students, luckily. But there isn't any reason to be. The real problems are um, uh, not, the parties do not end up black and white in, this, in solving these problems. Um, OK, so in Indonesia, there's this shift a gradual Islamization of the society has created an environment ripe for populist figures employing exclusivist Islamic rhetoric. So that's why in these lectures, uh, I have quoted from, I have emphasized this humanistic history of Islam 
and then in the in the um, conference in um, at the Pontifical Academy, the people representing Islam were liberal arts, president of liberal arts school, which is very humanistic, the liberal arts tradition, and then a prominent scholar in um, developing an Islam Islamic version of Aristotle's Islamicist Aristotelian ethic. I have argued for why that ethic is consistent with systems thinking. So why Islam would be very consistent with systems thinking. Um, and so that would be the counter to this gradual Islamization. The more um, people's identity gets caught up in being Islam, is Muslim rather than being Indonesian, Indonesian identity. But scholars can step up, they should step up. Uh, and it's the same with the US, we need to step up. A nation of Christians is not a Christian nation. So our founders did not want our country to be a Christian nation. And the conservatives really are trying to beat that into people so they actually believe it. It was not true. Our founders were intellectuals like Mr. Sukarno and they were religious heretics. They had a, a belief in God that was heretical. It was consistent with Newton's Newtonian physics where the traditional belief in God was connected to Aristotle. That's why, again, the contemporary systems thinkers, neuroscientists, uh, biologists, all these people have questioned Newtonian physics, right? So that idea of God needs to be replaced with monism. Um, all right, so although polarization remains relatively shallow and limited to periods surrounding elections, I hope so, again, I hope this is true for you. Deepening political divisions have nonetheless contributed to a worrisome decline in democracy. The incumbent government has increasingly used illiberal tactics against its political opponents and relatively secular leaders have chosen to accommodate majoritarian agendas rather than defending pluralism. So this is where NU and Muhammadiyah, if they stick together, they emphasize moderate Islam and they emphasize religious pluralism, humanism, creating a middle class, all this stuff for Panchasilla, as NU, as Muhammadiyah, if they develop a curriculum, they can um, avoid this decline, but it takes an effort. The most, when uh, a president does use illiberal tactics, representatives from NU and Muhammadiyah together should publicly say they don't agree with that. Just so you get, if you can get enough Indonesians to be on board, to really think that this common ground between NU and Muhammadiyah is compelling, and you can get those leaders to work together. And then you can also get leaders from the other traditions, but of course the vast majority are Muslims. So not letting the presidents have, have to, okay, so if the candidates have to accommodate the more extremists in order to win an election, but if NU and Muhammadiyah stick together, Hopefully, that would not be the case, that there would be one of the candidates would stand out as being more moderate than the other. But there's no way that they could um, would publicly come out and say that because instantly that candidate would have the license to be less moderate. <laughs> if he's got the backing, they can hide their greed or their power loss. So um, just constantly calling out all the candidates, asking questions, what would you do here? What would you do here? What about that? What about that? Why did you do that? Calling out every kind of illiberal 
claim, every kind of more extremist Muslim claim. Of course, it's easy for me to say, but my political candidates, they have all sorts of racist dog whistles, implicit racism, explicit racism, um, intolerant religion, they'll say it flat out. Sometimes they just sort of imply it. I mean, they do all this stuff. And um, I don't really know of very many organizations that have enough buy-in from the public that can really stand up and have a platform of holding them accountable. There are a num number of people who have started new organizations. Um, Invisible is one of them, but they just sort of come and go because there's so many organizations in the US, uh, but because NU and Mohammedia are large, and if you put them together, they're even larger. I, I think that would be a, a path forward. It's just a suggestion. Uh, the most prominent cleavage is religious, right? If that's the most prominent cleavage, then if you get NU and Muhammadiyah to come together, they could also come together on a K through 12 educational curriculum and on a UN school educational curriculum so that the public has a common language a common educational history, the Muslim public, a huge chunk of them. So that would be, it would be good if all the teachers, so they get college education, they go back to the village to teach. They've got this whole thing going and they agree with each other. I mean, it's complicated anyway with people becoming divisive, but that's why at the top, it's so important to provide leadership that really really sticks to Panchasilla, which, you know, shouldn't be so hard since it's right there. Polarization, political polarization manifested in increasingly harsh divides is a, uh, between opposing political camps is a crucial part of this decline in democracy. Although Indonesia has enjoyed a generally positive democratizing run, since the fall of the strongman President Suharto in 1998, recent elections have been marked by an upsurge in divisive and exclusivist Islamic rhetoric. So you know this better than I do. I just, I think Indonesians would probably agree with that. I'm not sure um, what else they would agree with or disagree with with, with the next few slides. Politicians on both sides of the divide consciously mobilized religiously charged and divisive rhetoric to attack their opponents. Big mistake, uh, but what can I say? I mean, my country does this too. Yudo Yono valued accommodation and stability. His most important role was to moderate these divisions by mediating between the conflicting forces and interests to which they gave rise. So the first time I was there was 2012. And that was when he was in power and he was sort of using contracts to sort of paper over differences. And that's where he got in trouble. Um, he, his employees, you know, government leaders were taken to court. I think some of them were put in jail, um, but they were trying to be accommodating. And so what happened after that, the campaigns of 2014, 2017, 2019, the politicians cast their opponents as a threat to Islam, as an affront to Indonesia's national identity, that would be Panchasila, and as an illegitimate other. So I don't know what you think, right? Is this accurate? And you can just talk to yourself or each other, or actually when I give this lecture, I can find out from my colleagues and I would write that in to my, to this lecture, but okay. I was there in 2012, 2017. So that was, I was in Jakarta when there was this very controversial divisive election for governor between Ahok and Anis. And then I was there in 2022, 
when they pass the criminal code. So I perceive those as major disruptions, uh, major threats to the democracy. But again, Indonesians have to decide what they think. By the end of the Yodho Yono era, there was a general mood of dissatisfaction with the status quo government. Limited progress had been made in the fight against corruption. There had been little improvement in infrastructure and general economic development. And Indonesia was suffering from growing income inequality. This isn't all their fault, you know, and it's not necessarily because of political corruption. If the IMF and the World Bank, if the Westerners are forcing some of this and the politicians have to do what they command, you know, or they aren't going to get contracts or whatever. But that isn't what the public sees. That isn't what they vote on the basis of. And um, so it doesn't necessarily make a lot of difference. The sort of anti-corruption rhetoric, okay, that helped him win in 2004 now sounded disingenuous and had little traction with the electorate because large numbers of government ministers and parliamentarians from all parties had been arrested for extortion and bribery over the course of his presidency. So yeah, that's what I was saying. I've told my Indonesian colleagues that the very fact that that happened, I told my students when I was teaching there in 2012, they would get discouraged, right? They read the paper, oh, corruption, corruption. Indonesia is number 114 out of 100, no, 144 out of 207 or something at the UN. And um, I said, wait a sec, you didn't even have a free and fair election till 1998. And this is 2012. And you're like 20 years old. You didn't even have free election till you were eight years old. So come on, you know, cut yourself some slack. This is an indication that you have a healthy democracy. Why? Okay, first of all, you had a free press that reported the corruption. You know, that is a cornerstone of democracy. Second of all, you had laws. There were actual laws, so it was illegal for um, uh, extortion and bribery. Uh, I would say that we have laws where what I think of as extortion and bribery is actually legal because our the rich folk in our country have used the politicians as puppets and they've created laws that are seriously unjust. So you're not breaking the law, but you're behaving in very unjust ways. So definitely Jeff Bezos and Musk and Zuckerberg, they ought to be in prison for tax evasion, for not paying their, their taxes. The trouble is our tax law is so horrible that they actually have found the loopholes, they've hired the tax lawyers, what they do is legal. So second one is you actually have laws against this. Thirdly, you have lawyers that took them to court without getting assassinated or without being afraid of getting assassinated. That's what happens in an authoritarian government. They might have the press and the laws, but if anybody takes it to court, they're gonna get killed so much for a free society, okay? Then the government officials also had a right to a lawyer and a trial. That's democracy. Then the trial was reported in the press, so that's democracy. Then the judge or jury, I don't know which one, but let's assume the judge actually called them guilty. <laughs> Whereas Donald Trump is appointing judges that don't, wouldn't call him guilty. The judges are protecting him from legal problems. It's pretty bad. Anyway, so that, unfortunately, that's probably why I, this, I'm aware of this. But so you had a judge that said you're guilty. 
and you got to go to jail, right? So not only are you guilty, it's not like, well, you're guilty, but you don't have to do anything, right? No, no. You have to pay a fine. You got to go to jail. And then the jailer or the prison warden hasn't said, no, no, <laughs> I'm not putting them in here. No, you're in here. You do the wrong thing. You're in here. So that's what? Seven, five, six, seven different steps that show you have a healthy democracy. Because whenever you have any centralization of wealth and power, some people are going to be corrupt. But if you have a free press and you have good laws and you enforce them, you have people that can enforce them. You have a right to a trial. You have, you know, uh, objective judges and juries, and you have a criminal justice system that will actually put bad people in jail and make them pay and all that. So all of that could break down, but they had a functioning system. And now the question is, with the criminal court, one of the articles of that law is that the president can arrest someone, a member of the press, that insults the president. That really scares me. And it's a serious, they can go into prison for two years or something. That's not a free press. But again, when I talk to my Indonesian colleagues, they either don't seem to know about it or they don't think it's very serious. So, but I know the Western press has thought it was really serious. So that's why I think Indonesians should know English because they just should know what the English speaking press is saying about them. It might be wrong, but Australia, although if it's Murdoch's newspapers, I don't know, but in general, Australia, Japan, Britain, Germany, America, and the Jakarta Press, these English-based press, presses supposedly come from democratic societies, and they would report Indonesia from the filter of, does it look like they're preserving their democracy? Does it look like they're, they're losing their democracy? And Indonesians at least need to know what those English speaking respectable newspapers in the West or in free societies, democracies are actually saying about them. Um, might be right, might be wrong, but not to know, I think is serious. Every Indonesian that would write an editorial in Indonesian would know that their whole future depends upon what they say. So they might not be honest. They could lose their reputation. They could lose their job. They could lose a lot of stuff. So it would be an outside newspaper, maybe um, an editorial in the Jakarta Post. Even the Jakarta Post, you know, maybe it has a good enough reputation. It can, it can do this. But that's my, you know, the main reason I think to learn English is not necessarily to study abroad, it's just to be able to read what uh, newspapers that get a reward for defending free and open societies would be saying about Indonesia. Populism, is Jokowi a populist? So this is another big wave these days. Populism is a form of mobilization in which a political figure seeks direct connection to the voters, bypassing traditional party voter linkages. Trump tried to pull this off, right? Uh, to do this, populists often frame themselves as political outsiders. They appeal to the notion of a pure common people who are exploited by a corrupt and illegitimate other, the elites, right? Like the political elite, or a minority group. Uh, Jokowi connected directly with voters as an alternative to the familiar cast of corrupt oligarchs, bureaucrats, military elites who had long dominated national politics. Um, his secular orientation, he had a secular orientation, but he was a practicing Muslim. He got support 
from moderate Muslims, minority communities, reformist civil society groups, and human rights organizations. Uh, his political party is a direct descendant of Sukarno's PNI. The moderate PKB linked to the NU is what the article said. Um, so I don't know what Mohammedia thinks of that. Uh, I don't know if, anyway, this is what the article said. So Prabowo had a divisive and illiberal brand of populism. A former general of the New Order period, Suharno, he blamed economic and political problems on greedy elites and nefarious foreign agents, including the wealthy ethnic Chinese minority. So that was that repeats this old tradition of where Suharto demonized the Chinese. Um, this he is his neo-authoritarianism wants to return Indonesia to the old 1945 constitution. This is what the conservatives in my country, conservative judges are doing. He favors executive power. That's again, the Republican party is um, centralizing power in the executive, which is primarily the president, the president and his appointees, okay? There's no place for direct presidential elections. That's what they're aiming for. A history of opportunistically collaborating with hardline Islamic groups during his time in the military. And he claimed that Jokowi would lead to the marginalization of Islam from the political arena. This is the same that happens in the Republican. They say the Democrats, the progressives are marginalizing Christianity or they're demonizing whatever. Anyway, he cites risks posed by Christians, Indonesia's Chinese minority, and communists. Both social media networks and traditional media outlets were used to spread false rumors, memes, and doctored photos attacking Jokowi's Islamic credentials. So, you know, this is familiar. It's happening all over the world. And I don't know. The author clearly prefers one candidate to the other. I'm not quite sure what my colleagues think of that. Is Indonesia losing its democracy? What do you think? In the NU heartland of East and Central Java, two provinces rich in votes, NU's sprawling network of Islamic boarding schools was mobilized to support the president. The campaign message was a message of us versus them. NNU and PKB, militant pluralism. So it was like a militant pluralism, right? We're pluralists and those guys are the bad guys, which painted any Islamist, Islamist group affiliated with pro bono as a threat to Indonesia's national identity and the state's pluralistic foundation, which would be Pancasila. And NU's leaders around the country were enlisted to convince the electorate that a Prabowo victory would open the door to an Islamic caliphate and the rise of radical Islamic groups. Um, all right, so you can, you know, figure out if you think that's fair, if that's what really happened. I know that I was teaching in 2020, oh, 2021, I think or 2022 in the summer at an Islamic boarding school in East Central Java. And the students really were committed to moderate Islam. I don't know if they were NU or Mohammedia, and I don't know if they favored a political candidate, but really it's the commitment to Panchasila religious pluralism and Islam and democracy, which is the most important thing. And they were committed to that. And I had read that they were the tipping point in these elections. So that was kind of amazing. So I did tell them, you know, it's very important. I'm a pluralist. And, you know, I tried to emphasize everything that I talk about here. 90%, um, 90, excuse me. Do you think this is fake news? Do you think? 
first reporter, this uh, Brookings Institute um, author is accurate. I'm really curi curious to know if Muslims, if my colleagues think so. 90% of non-Muslims voted 97% for Jacoby. In conservative areas, it was a higher percent for Prabowo. While Jokowi won by a convincing margin, Prabowo refused to accept his defeat. He told the public the election had been rigged, protests evolved into violent riots. Some of the worst election-related violence in the country, the country has seen since 1998. I mean, this is bad, right? These are bad signs. And I'm worried, Americans are worried this is going to happen in a few months when we have our election in November. Uh, Trump did not accept the results of the election. And for four years, he's been just beating that drum. He just won't admit it. All the evidence goes against him. All the technology, all the ways we had to verify that it was legitimate. He just keeps saying it's not. And he just has almost half the country will just go along with it, which is just shocking to me. Um. Reports were emerging that paid thugs had instigated this violence. Pro bono strategically, this happened with Martin Luther King. Um, the FBI and CIA paid people to, tr to trigger violence. Pro bono strategically cultivated a tense atmosphere by rejecting Dakota's victory, mobilized his followers into the streets, and encouraged them to challenge Indonesia's democratic institutions. The effect was to further divide Indonesia's national political landscape. I mean, that sounds pretty bad to me. So I kind of wonder what my colleagues think. Polarization in Indonesia still appears relatively shallow and contingent. The Islamist Pluralist cleavage is not linked to a range of political preferences. Provincial parliamentarians are not divided. There's an impulse for centrism and moderation. This is where connecting with the more provincial is what the university community engagements can do. Members of all political parties stated that they could work and form coalitions with any other party. This would be, again, the kind of village uplift projects that Indonesia has had over the years. They regularly form coalitions in religion, elections across the country, uh, and in uh, legislative elections, party loyalty and ideology differences matter far less than personal connections and patriot, patronage distribution in determining voters' preferences. So the prag there's a pragmatic pursuit of patronage. That was what Mr. Uh, the, the previous president had done and he got caught for extortion and things like that. But he was kind of based on this sort of system of patronage. Um, so how should intellectuals lead the way to reduce polarization? Um, the deep historical divisions within the Islamic political community itself are important. The NU is a bastion of tolerance and moderation. And this, as far as I can, can tell from Mr. Marif, his view of Muhammadiyah, I don't know why they don't mention Muhammadiyah. I, I do not understand that. And, you know, I sort of wonder about it. It just shows how naive I am. But it also shows how I think my point of view should help Indonesians kind of wake up and say, are we really making this a bigger deal than it should be? Or what does her perspective, without her knowing of NU Muhammadiyah, how could that help us move forward instead of her finding out about all the dirt under the rug and taking sides or something. Um, I don't think I should take sides, even though this article, it doesn't look too good <laughs> for Prabowo, but you know, it's up to you. Um, 
By its uh, NU has its own internal ideological divisions. Uh, leadership takes a flex flexible, even opportunistic approach to politics, building alliances with parties and figures across the ideological spectrum. So 40% of NU voted for Prabowo. Uh, so again, it's not super polarized politically if you can just maintain this moderate Islam and somehow use that to, to hold the candidates accountable. Many prominent religious figures and organizations do not fit neatly into one category or the other, which means they should speak out and they should expose every candidate. Right now, the polarization might be caused by the particular candidates and would then change with different candidates. Hopefully, right? It could even get worse with different candidates. So I would say um, NU and Mohammedia should really work together and they should try to demand better candidates and better political rhetoric and better follow through. How polarization can erode democratic quality? Because in an attempt to defend the status quo against these undemocratic others, people may begin to undertake actions or employ discourses that end up undermining democracy and advancing authoritarianism. This is the trend that's emerging in Indonesia. Polarization is a process, not a static state and elite actions can have deep and lasting effects on a community. In Indonesia, the author says people feel more divided than ever. Personal relationships have changed. She interviewed people who felt alienated from various relatives. What could be done to deal with it? Remedy the problem. Groups with a long history of supporting programs for the consolidation of a liberal democracy in Indonesia. They fund inter interfaith dialogues. They support community initiatives that try to combat hate speech and religious extremism. I was asked to give a talk on hoaxes and hate speech um, in 2019 at a pretty major event in the largest auditorium at the UN Jakarta. Um, sponsoring online social media channels that encourage religious tolerance, cultural awareness, fact-based knowledge production, and that are designed to generally cultivate a positive on online discourse. Okay, it's important. There must be a genuine buy-in from Indonesia's political elite, and Mr. Marif would definitely agree. Both Prabowo and Jokowi routinely called for an end to divisive identity politics, but these rhetorical commitments have often proved disingenuous. Both um, routinely called for an end to fake news, yet they both had uh, dedicated cyber arm armies that were tasked with generating social media messages that question their rivals. I, I used this quote before. It's an essential risk for a candidate. This is, this is a problem, at least from my point of view. It's an electoral risk for a candidate to have a secular sensibility and a pluralistic orientation, or indeed to be a member of an ethno-religious minority. Support for conservative Islamic agendas are a narrowing of the space for secular politics and liberal ideas. There's growing polarization. So, of course, that would worry me, not just because, well, because I like democracy, because it's a misunderstanding of Islam. It's a corruption of Islam. And um, it's it's a corruption of what Muhammad would want. It's a corruption of the Quran. I mean, it's everything. I mean, political corruption is not isolated from all other kinds of corruption. Uh, we all need each other. We all depend on each other. It's a corruption of trust and goodwill between citizens. I mean, it's just description of the polis and all the 
benefits the polis provides, which is if you have a thriving middle class, you have free scientific inquiry, free press, free artistic expression, free speech, free association, all that stuff gets corrupted. And it gets corrupted, you know, at the same time. It's not just the political system. Political system is part of a culture, which is a feedback loop, you know? Every one of those pieces is both a, and a cause and effect. And they, they um, mirror each other. So you can, your culture is always changing in one way or the other in terms of, is it heading toward more freedom in this political association sense or less? Is it leading toward military domination of the world? Are the Timocrats taking over? Is it leading toward the wealthy, you know? the domination of the rich. So that's where the world tends to be going. Is it gravitating toward the domination of authoritarian personalities, which is another huge problem. It follows from the rule of the rich. Is it also being taken over by this domination of freedom, meaning that I can believe anything I want? Uh, that that happened in Athens too. License to live however you like. And what happened then was a lot of people got into debt and then they would blame the rich and then the authoritarian personality would punch their buttons and get elected. So this has definitely happened in the US. It's crazy because Plato writes about that in the Republic book eight. It is what happened to Athens. I mean, there's some things, you know, that that don't change amidst all the things that do change. That's why the humanities is important. That's why education and analogies is important. That's why deep reading is important. That section on neuroscience and education. Um, and that's, and you could have a curriculum that had all of those characteristics as a support for Panchasilla. As a matter of fact, you should have that kind of curriculum. In a previous lecture, I suggested structuring these UCE projects in a way that aims to reduce polarization. Chinese businesses, other groups should sponsor projects. Members should be from different groups booklets. So that's just a repeat of what I said before. I was just surprised that the author of this article, when she talks about remedies, how to how to remedy the situation, she doesn't mention that. So um, in the USA, religion is one factor, but the Republican Party since 2001 created a party brand that focused on getting Southerners to vote Republican. So this brand includes, because the fact that we had slavery in the Southern US and not the Northern has always been a big problem in our country. It's undermined our democracy right from the start. The brand, this brand includes bringing us back to God. We were the first secular state. So this is a complete lie about our country. Guns. We have virtually no regulation. We have the most shootings, like 30,000 suicides and homicides a year, uh, anti-gay, and that was just cynical. The people who, who constructed the whole uh, political rhetorical campaign against gays were not anti-gay. All they did was manipulate people. That's all it was about to cover up what they really cared about was to go into Iraq to get cheap oil and to dominate economically and to not have to pay taxes and to create an entrenched wealthy class. That's their real agenda. The reason that's obvious is that um, Dick Cheney, the vice president under Bush and a major neocon has a daughter who's gay who he's very close to. And um, he has come out since Bush has been out of office 
saying, well, we didn't have any problem with that, but they will do anything to manipulate the public. It's extremely cynical. It's extremely anti-democratic. Um, and this is gay, gay, you know, non-binary sexuality is being used by authoritarian leaders around the country, around the world. They're taking their cues from us. It works. They don't care. Some of them care. Some of them don't care. But it's not an important political issue. People can't make people gay or straight. And when you use politics that way, all you're doing is covering up for the centralization of wealth and power. Uh, minimal government. So working class people should not vote for minimal government. They shouldn't hate government. Government is what provides them with a tax structure, the redistribution of wealth, public schools, all the things that they depend on, social security, healthcare, roads. Um, but the rhetoric of the rich and of the political um, candidates that get paid by the rich, is just keeps getting pounded into people. So they hate government, whatever that is. We're cutting our environmental laws. We're cutting back, you know, we're, tr we're getting back to laws that were related to the country in 1776. We had slavery, women didn't vote. There was all sorts of crazy stuff that no thinking American at this moment could possibly want. We're also crippling our ability to go green and compete with the Chinese for green energy and for the next wave of economic development. So this is true in Indonesia. We need to have this new wave. It's, a new, it's the fourth um, technological uh, paradigm shift. Uh, there's a book by Jeffrey Sachs about the seven ages of globalization. This is just another, the seventh stage of globalization. Always in the past, radical shifts, huge changes, and a lot of war and conflict. The rise of authoritarian leaders because people are afraid of change and they punch those buttons and get people to give them power and then they just abuse it. So Jeffrey Sachs wrote the book to try and tell people, don't do this. Um, it's not a book that a, an average person would read, but educated person should read it, try to convey it to the public, try to explain everybody's involved in this. It's not, you know, it, I'm not putting you down. Um, I don't think I'm better than you. We're all in this together, uh, Indonesian, People are having the same problems that other people are. And the real issue is that globalization was mismanaged. And so now the West, and particularly America, has had an incredible advantage. And we have squandered it. And now the Chinese are rising. And we're mad about it. And we're resisting. I mean, it's we are dysfunctional, I think. And Indonesia needs to find its way through all of this and not buy in, you know, to any sort of rhetoric that would harm their own interests. They have an interest in in working with ASEAN, in, in going green. There's a lot of things that they have an interest in that's consistent with their ideology and their culture. Just have to keep developing it keep working on it and intellectuals and college teachers need to convey that to students as they go out into the world and whatever jobs they have, but especially as educators, they spread their cultural values in the next era of globalization.